Hello. Today I'm going to read a story, an essay, from this book, Slanted Truths. It's uh, by Dorian Sagan, Lynn Margulis, and Ricardo Guerrero. And it's called Descartes, Dualism, and Beyond. The brilliant French Catholic mathematician René Descartes, 1596 to 1650, inaugurated the mechanistic dichotomy with his declaration of a universal split between res extensa, the determined re material reality of nature, and res cogitans, the free-thinking reality of people and God. Only humans, Descartes argued, partake of God to the extent that they have souls. Animals, though they seem to feel pain, are in fact soulless machines. We are so accustomed to persuade ourselves that the brute feels, that the brute beasts feel as we do, that it is difficult for us to rid ourselves of this opinion. But if we were, I believe this is a Descartes quote. We are so accustomed to persuade ourselves that the brute beasts feel as we do, that it is difficult for us to rid ourselves of this opinion. But if we were as accustomed to seeing automata which imitate perfectly all those of our actions which they can imitate, and to taking them for automata only, we should have no doubt that all the irrational animals are automatons. Jonas, 1966. It's not Descartes. Although Descartes, Descartes' presentation of the universe as a vast mechanism led to an expansion of the scientific investigation, the acceptance of the Cartesian mechanistic universe also had negative implications. On the authority of Descartes, live animals were nailed to boards without remorse to illustrate the facts of anatomy and physiology. Rationalized as unfeeling and inanimate nature, in the wake of Descartes, was analyzed without fear of trespass. Nature, including the mechanical automata-like lower life forms, could now be experimented upon with impunity. In short, Descartes' philosophy provided a formal justification, a Cartesian license, to investigate virtually everything in an effort to discover the mechanism by which God had built the phenomenal world. <coughs> by splitting reality into human consciousness, into an unfeeling, objective exterior, or in his terms, extensive world, that could be measured mathematically, Descartes paved the way for a scientific investigation of nature constructed according to the mathematical laws of God. God sets up laws in nature just as a king sets up laws in his kingdom, he wrote, Berman, 1989. The Cartesian license separated matter from form, body from soul, outward spatially extended nature from inward awareness. Matter, body, and nature could, unlike thought or feeling, be measured, compared, and thus ultimately understood by mathematical laws. This Cartesian license permitted the human intellect through science to enter a thousand different realms from the gigantic to the subvisible. Once divine, the once divine was now open to scientific exploration. Optical instruments focused on snowflakes and peppercorns or pointed at pockmarked whiteness in the side-lit moon. Atoms were investigated by chemical combination and physical acceleration. X-rays imaged bones. Radioactive elements clocked the internal metabolism of the human body. Eventually, aeronautical engineered even appropriated the seemingly God-given power to fly. Investigation of the formerly divine realm yielded impressive scientific results. Scientists perusing nature and not books returned the Bible and the classics to their dusty shelves. There's a biographical antidote, perhaps apocryphal, that when Descartes was asked in his urban domicile about the location to his library, he pointed to a dissective calf he had been examining and said, on top of those books, There's a biographical and an anecdote, perhaps apocryphal, that when Descartes was asked in his urban domicile 
about the location of his library. He pointed to a dissect, dissected dis, he pointed it to a dissected calf he had been examining and said, on top of those books. Scientists began to study the world written as Galileo had put it even prior to Descartes in the great book which was always open before our eyes. Galileo had paid dearly for his inquisitive temperament. As a quantitative mechanist, measurer of falling bodies, discoverer of the moons of Jupiter and the rotation of the Earth, it was Galileo who had cleared the trail for curious successors such as Descartes, Newton, and the prince of astronomy, William Herschel, 1738 to 1822, who confirmed that the Milky Way is a spiral-shaped object formed by the distribution of its component stars. A large sign saying, study nature, not books, is attributed to the Lewis Agassiz's doctorates in the library in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. A defier of potent philosophers and Christian theologians, Galileo provoked the ire of church authorities. He was, at age 58, brought before the Inquisition and charged with heresy. Galileo recanted his earlier claims that were so at variance with official church doctrine, he admitted that the earth is at the center of the universe. Warned against further heresy, Galileo, who became a prisoner in his own country home, was condemned to three years of weekly psalm recitations. Indeed, his thoughts were censured for nearly 200 years until 1838, Galileo's immensely popular masterpiece, Dialogue of the Chief, Two Chief World Systems, was banned. The book was banned until 1838. With horror, Pope Urban VIII recognized himself in Galileo's imagined character, Simplicio, correctly believing that he had been mocked, it was Urban who began the censorship. If Galileo had worked under the Cartesian license, he would have fared better. When in 1633 the devout Descartes learned of Galileo's condemnation, he abandoned work on a manuscript that supported a heliocentric rather than earth-centered world. Impelled to integrate science into religion, Descartes gave great impetus to modern practices of investigation by doubting everything but the existence of his own doubting mind. Bodies he held were clock-like mechanisms created by a creator. The body is connected to the mind, he wrote, via the pineal gland, a pea-sized structure at the base of the brain known at that time in the 17th century only in humans. The pineal acted, Descartes suggested, as a valve through which God was connected to the free human soul. The Cartesian license still rallies scientists to study a universe wide open for investigation, but the fine print, to extend the metaphor, of this great card of admission into once forbidden realms ironically vouchsafes the same repressive, religion-based legacy it was designed to combat. Generating the mechanistic body is the conscious human mind, generating the mechanistic body is the conscious human mind in its deistic incarnation as the mind of God. This vitalistic residue of primordial consciousness remains the ghost within the machine of would-be, wholly materialistic modern science. The Cartesian license still contains in its metaphorical fine print the following assumption. The universe is mechanical and is set up according to the immutable laws by God. But neither the human exception to the predetermined laws of nature nor the metaphysical assumption of divine mechanism is science, nor the, nor the metaphysical assumption of divine mechanism is science. Cartesian philosophy is more imbued with the historical presuppositions of Western European culture than the pure objectivity it tops. Ultimately, we suggest, the Cartesian license proves to be a kind of forgery. After three centuries of implicit renewal, the permit is still valid, even though the fine print, worn off or ignored, is barely visible. Yet the fine print exempting humans and making machinate the objective world is no more peripheral to the Cartesian license than is the Surgeon General's warning on a box of cigarettes. 
the reason d'etre, the rational basis that authorized scientists to follow the spirit of Descartes to proceed with their work and to receive the blessings of society, including the church, are already implicit in Descartes' license. For many centuries, the Judeo-Christian theologies have placed man For many centuries, the Judeo-Christian religions had placed man, man as made in God's image, high on the ladder of being. People in the cultural mind of the literate world are situated perhaps a little lower than the angels, but certainly above the rest of life. While Descartes cogitated, Europe remained under the rule of royalty, the king and the lord presiding, representing the power and order of God reigned supreme. But licensed Cartesians, medical men, explorers, alchemists, soon entered the realms into which they were formally forbidden to enter, for fear of transgressing the sacred. Scientific revelation of mechanism, part of the new audacity of inquiry, helped unsettle European monarchy. If the universe made by God, the giant automaton that works itself, why should people obey any king or lord whose power, God given in the feudal system of medieval Christianity, no longer derived from heavenly decree? Many began to take seriously what they took to be the implications of the liberating free inquiry. Highborn Frenchman Donatien Alphonse de Francois Sade and the infamous Marquis de Sade, for example, keenly wrote about and lived his conviction that the religious basis for morality had vanished. If nature were a self-perpetuating machine and no longer a purveyor of divine authority, then why did the outrageous acts that he performed matter at all? All was, at best, the morally neutral turning of the wheels in a vast, more lifelike than living auto automatic mechanism. In 1776, the British colonists of North America broke free from transatlantic rule. Independence from the burdens of taxes and royalty was proclaimed. In 1789, the French Revolution deposed the king and stripped the lords and ladies of their powers. The Reverend Voltaire claimed that if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. A century later, the German philologist and nihilistic aesthetician Friedrich Nietzsche declared outright that God is dead. He defined philosophy as the unfettered love of knowledge and the philosopher as he before whom everyone quivers. Philosophy, he wrote, is a terrible explosive in the presence of which everything is in danger. England, too, was struck by the revolutionary spirit of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Expansionist and socially moderate, however, the English retaining their king and queen perceived themselves as a bastion of order in a world gone mad. The Cartesian influence was profound. By the late 19th century, Western thought suffered a metaphysical reversal. The diminution of the importance of, God, of the God-given human body and mind was more and more supported by the expanding, skeptical, scientific worldview. Our pre-scientific ancestors tended to consider the universe and everything that moved to be alive. Beings were exempted from life only when they stopped moving, only when the spirit left them by the natural magic trick of death. But now things had changed in the new scientific mechanistic world of Galileo, Descartes, and Newton. The universe and all the beings in it were inanimate. The scientific puzzle moved from the mystery of death in a live cosmos to that of life in a dead one. The scientific puzzle moved from the mystery of death in a live cosmos, to that of life in a dead one. Wow, well, that is a sentence. Inanimate matter had been rendered soulless and dead by the mechanist. Even animate matter was soulless and dead by the minds of strict Cartesians, who, with time, began losing their sway. But the universe is neither the dead mausoleum investigated by Cartesian license, nor an enchanted fairy tale of invisible spirits. We, all, as sci citizens, scientists, scholars, or simply curious readers, are interested in life because we admire it from the inside. We feel life is something more than purely mechanical, 
and yet its freedom, if it exists, seems dubious to credit to a divine god. We do react to stimuli, but we also seem to be able to think, to act, to choose. We seem far more than either Cartesian autonoma or entirely predictable Newtonian machines. Perhaps we are neither. But if we are more than Cartesian autonoma, automata, so after Darwin must be the rest of life. Otherwise, we risk a great inconsistency. Here we have the introduction of the deep continuity. This cultural, dualistic inheritance presents a continuing challenge to science. Given the limited legacy of Cartesian dualism, mind, body, spirit, matter, life, non-life, it may be surprising that, the two of the, that two of the most profound 20th century rethinkers of life in its context share a biospheric perspective, yet have diametrically opposed views. Russian scientist Vladimir Ivanovich Verandesky, 1853-1944, described organisms as he described materials, calling them living matter, whereas our friend and colleague English scientist James Lovelock, born 1920, has problematized the Earth's surface in such a way that the entire body biosphere, including rocks and air, may be regarded as a lot. Randesky portrayed living matter as a geological force, indeed the greatest of all geological forces. Life moves and transforms matter, matter across oceans and continents. Life as flying phosphorus rich seagulls, racing schools of mackerel, and sediment churning polychaete worms traverses the near earth environment, chemically transforming our planet's surface. Life, at the expense of the sun's energy, has been largely responsible for the great differences between the third planet and our solar system neighbors, specifically the unusual oxygen-rich and carbon dioxide poor atmosphere of the Earth relative to those of Venus and Mars. In a tradition begun by Christian Dr. Ehrenberg, 1795 to 1876, Alexander von Humboldt, 1769 to 1859, and other serious explorers before him, Verandesky described what he called the everywhereness of life. Living matter, he noticed, was totally penetrated into and consequently became involved in superficially inanimate processes of weathering, water flow, and wind circulation. While his contemporaries spoke of the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms, Verandesky analyzed the Earth's phenomena without labeling and classifying them into these categories. He eschewed preconceived, preconceived notions of what was and was not alive, perceiving life not as some abstract entity with its philosophical, historical, and religious connotations, referred only to the living matter. This treatment combined as needed in neurology, theology, and biology into a new discipline. Impressed by the movement of machines in World War I, what struck Verandesky most is that the material of the Earth's crust is packaged into myriad moving beings whose reproduction and growth depend on solar energy while they build and break down matter. Life, he saw, was a global phenomenon. Humans, for example, are accelerators of life's tendency to redistribute and concentrate the chemical elements of the Earth. Iron, aluminum, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, phosphorus, <coughs> many other elements of the Earth's crust are rapidly altered and mobilized by living beings, especially the two-legged, upright wanderers of our own species. People, he explained, have an amazing propensity to dig into, build up, move around, and in countless other ways alter the chemistry of the Earth's surface. We, in Verandesky's view, represent a new phase in biogeochemical evolution. Verandesky, Vernon, Vern, am I saying this wrong? <laughs> Vernansky contrasted gravity, which pulls material vertically towards the center of the Earth, with life growing, running, swimming, and flying against the gravitational force. Life, challenging gravity, moves matter horizontally across the surface. 
Bernanski detailed the structure and distribution of aluminosilicates in the Earth's crust. He was the first to recognize the importance of heat released from radioactivity to geological change. But even a resolute materialist like Bernanski found a place for mind. Bernanski's view was a special thinking Bernanski's view was a special thinking layer of organized matter growing and changing the Earth's surface was associated with humans and technology. To describe it, he adopted the term new sphere from the term nuos, mind. The term nuos sphere itself was introduced by Edouard Leroy at the College of France. Bernanski met Leroy along with Pilar de Chardin, the French paleontologist and professor of priests whose writings would later bring the idea of the new sphere of life to a wider audience in Paris and intellectual discussions in the 1920s. To the odds and for Lansky's use of the term new sphere, conscious layer of life, uh, new sphere, like their slants on evolution in general, differed. For Tilliard, the new sphere was the human planetary layer forming outside and above the biosphere, while for, Ver Ver while for Verendensky, the new sphere referred to humanity and technology as an accelerating yet integral part of the planetary biosphere. Vernansky distinguished himself from other theorizers by his staunch refusal to erect a special category for life. Life was far less a thing with properties than a happening, a process. Living beings in Vernansky's writing are moving, chemically curious, but predictable forms of the common spirit, liquid mineral H2O we call water. Animated water, life with all its wetness, displays a power of movement exceeding that of limestone, silicon, and even air. It shapes Earth's surface. Emphasizing the continuity of watery life and rocks, such as that evident in coal or fossil limestone reefs, Bernanski developed the idea, later, later elaborated by Lapo, that apparently in their geological strata are traces of bygone biospheres. Bernanski and Lovelock, global scientists both, but from distinct vantage points, have articulated ways in which life is far more than a Cartesian automaton or any other sort of machine. The worldviews of both complementary and com the worldviews of both complementary and complex were constructed from the usual scientific observations of minutia. Many eluded them both in spite of their keen powers of observation and sharply focused careers. Consider this. When offered a variety of foodstuffs, bacteria, ciliates, mastigotes, and other swimming microbes make selections. They choose. Squirming forward on retractable pseudopods, amoeba, proteus, pliants, tetrahymena, delectable, but avoids chromopromenos. Paramecium prefers to feed on small ciliates, but if starved for these and other proteins, it reluctantly sweeps aromenads and other bacteria into its cell now. Although nearly protocysts, foraminifera, forams for short, are one of the most diverse groups of fossil forming small organisms, an astounding variety of magnificent shells are made by these simple, single cell beings, some 40,000 different species which have evolved in the last 520 million years. Forams outside of their shells resemble amoebas with a network of long, thin, fusing, and branching pseudopods. In certain forams, those called agglutinators, the shells are formed from handy starting materials from the seashore environment. Sand, chalk, sponge, spicules, even other forearm shells are patched together and agglutinated to make the coverings. To appropriate their cell shell, their cell shell homes, these forearms place available particles in their surroundings together with organic cement. Experiments have shown, however, that when presented with a hodgepodge of different particles, foraminifera make distinct choices based on shape and size, selecting, for example, small black over larger red glass beads. Some will bridle at the term choice. However, there seems to be no reliable criterion for distinguishing between the preferential activities of these beings and ourselves. Without brains or hands, these proteins pick the building materials from which to construct their body homes. I want to read 
read that paragraph again because I made a video called Interpenetration. I talk about one of the uh, and uh, this. It has so much to say about the notion of free will, and I just want to dwell on it for a moment. Although nearly protocists, foraminifera, forams for short, are one of the most diverse fossil forming groups of small organisms. An astounding variety of magnificent shells are made by these complex single cell beings, some 40,000 different species which have evolved in the last 520 million years. Forams outside their shells resemble amoebas with, long, with a long network of thin, fusing and branching pseudopods. In certain forams, dolls called agglutinators, the shells are formed from handy starting materials from the seashore environment. Sand, chalk, sponge spicules, even other foram shells are patched together agglutinated to make the coverings. To appropriate their cell shell homes, these forams place available particles from their surroundings together with an organic cement. Experiments have shown, however, that when presented with a hodgepodge of different particles, foraminifera make distinct choices based on shape and size, selecting, for example, small black over larger red glass beads. Some will bridle at the term of choice, however, there seems to be no reliable criterion for distinguishing between the preferential activities of these beings and ourselves. Without brains or hands, these proteists pick the building materials from which they construct their body homes. Body homes. Is this a body home? Yeah. Smaller still, and far simpler in cell organization, chemotactic bacteria can sense chemical differences. These little bodies, just two microns, two millionths of a meter long, swing towards sugar and away from acid. A chemotactic bacterium without a nose, of course, can smell a difference in chemical concentration that is a mere one part in 10,000 more concentrated at one end of its body than at the other end. Biochemist and former editor-in-chief of the leading scientific journal Science Magazine, Daniel Kochlin, expressed the spiritual tendencies of the colon bacteria E. coli as follows. Choice, discrimination, memory, learning, instinct, judgment and adaptation are words we normally identify with higher higher neural processes. Yet, in a sense, a bacterium can be said to have each of these properties. It would be unwise to conclude that the analogies are only semantic, since there seem to be underlying relationships in molecular mechanisms and biological function. For example, Learning in animal species involves long-term events and complex interactions, but certainly induced enzyme formation must be considered one of the more likely molecular devices for fixing some neuronal connections and eliminating others. The difference between instinct and learning, then, becomes a matter of time scale, not of principle. Many organisms too small to be seen without a microscope sense and avoid heat, move towards or away from light. Certain bacteria even detect magnetic fields. Some harbor magnets aligned in rows along the length of their tiny, rod-shaped bodies. That bacteria are simply machines with no sensation or consciousness seems no more likely than Descartes' claim that dogs suffer no pain. We reject the idea that microbes act without any feeling. Although possible, the idea is ultimately solipsistic. Solipsism is the idea that everything in the world, including other people, is a projection of one's own imagination. Cells alive act as if they have feelings. Indigestible mold spores and certain bacteria are rejected by proteists. Others are greedily ingested. At even, a more, at even the most primordial level, living seems to entail sensation, choosing, mind. For 19th century men of science, it was natural and expedient in the Cartesian tradition to invoke physical mechanisms to explain life. 
Life as Newton's matter consists of material bits that predictably respond to forces and obey natural laws. Like well-made clockwork, the world's mechanism was manufactured by the transcendent God, the creative God that constructed magnificent mathematical laws and then withdrew from his perfect and knowable creation. Life, though, was not created in six days. Ushered in by the shocking contribution of Charles Darwin and the new view of evolution, God, if he existed, was Newton's God. No active interloper in human details, he was a geometer god who made the laws. Beneath the new mathematical god was the ancient visidium of the idea of a more active god. In the earlier view of life, the idea that life itself was evolving but only partially mechanical was championed by Samuel Butler in 1835-1902, an English novelist and dark painter, musician, and essayist who Gregory Bateson wrote, call, who Gregory Bateson called Darwin's most able critic, Bateson, 1928. Butler took issue with the overly mechanistic views of Darwin. He suggested no grand design in nature, but recognized the continuity of life, to which he attributed millions of little purposes. Each purpose or objective was attributable to the cell or organism in its habitat. To Newtonians, Darwinians, and others in the direct lineage of Descartes, choice or free will had been banished from a mechanistic universe. For Descartes, God, of course, has consciousness, and people do as well, only in so far as they communicated with God. When Darwin's painstaking work led to the conclusion that, like non-human life, people too had evolved by the mechanism of natural selection, the consciousness that definitively separates man from the other suddenly became redundant. Butler, who argued against the special status of cogitating man, brought consciousness back into the discussion. He claimed that life is exuberant matter that chooses now and has chosen in the past. Over the eons, choices made by some life forms have produced more and different organisms, including the colonies of cells that stick together to become human individuals. Butler rejects a perfect, immovable mathematical god. His deity is imperfect and dispersed. The properties of life for Butler lie in all life. God and life are one. Butler's view that rejects any single universal omnipotent architect appeals to us. Life is too shoddy a production, both physically and morally, to have been designed by some austere, flawless master. And yet life is more impressive and less predictable than any object whose nature can be accounted for solely by forces acting on it deterministically. Butler's godlike qualities of life on Earth include neither omniscience nor omnipotent. Perhaps, though, an argument could be made from the omnipresence of earthly life. In the form of myriad cells, from luminescent bacteria to the lily-hopping frog, life is virtually everywhere on our third planet. All life is connected through Darwinian time and Verdanskian space. Evolution places us all in the stark but fascinating context of the cosmos. Although mystical powers may determine this cosmos, their existence is impossible to prove. The cosmos, more dazzling than any god of any particular religion, is enough for us. Life is existence's celebration. The features of purpose and determination that our culture tends to ascribe uniquely to people inhere intact in all of life. From life's minimal state as the tiny walled bacterial cell to its huge presence as a calf nursing elephant or a mountain rainforest, its exuberant, its sensible and sentient features apply to all of its forms. From life's minimal state as a tiny walled bacterial cell to its huge presence as a calf nursing elephant or a montane rainforest, its exuberance, its sensible and sentient features apply to all of its forms. Butler's theory intrigues us. We agree that mind and body are not separate, but part of the unified functioning whole. Life, sensitive from its onset, has been capable of choice, of decision, of sensing and thinking from the beginning. Such thoughts, both vague and clear, are physical. They are in the cells of our bodies and those of other animals. In 
Comprehending these sentences, certain ink squiggles trigger associations, the electrochemical connections of the brain and cells. Glucose is chemically altered by reaction of its components with oxygen, and its breakdown produces water and carbon dioxide enter brain blood vessels. Sodium and calcium ions pumped out traffic across a neuron's membrane. As you remember, nerve cells bolster their connection to new cell adhesion proteins forms and heat dissipates. Thought like life is matter and energy in flux. The body is its complement. Thinking and being are aspects of the same physical organization and its action. One accepts the fundamental continuity between mind and body, right? There's the deep continuity of mind and life said. If one accepts the fundamental continuity between body and mind, thought is essentially like all other physiology and behavior. Thinking, like excreting and ingesting, results from lively interactions of the beings of chemistry. Even microbial thinking derives from cell hunger, movement, growth, association, programmed death, satisfaction, and other intrinsica of all life. Restrained but healthy former microbes find alliances to construct and behaviors to practice. If what is called thought results from such cell interactions, then perhaps communicating organisms, each themselves thinking, can lead to a process greater than individual thought. This may be implicit in the Bernaskian notion of the neurosphere. Let's go back to that, okay? This is important. If what is called thought results from such cell interactions, then perhaps communicating organisms, each themselves thinking, can lead to a process greater than the individual thought. Even microbial thinking derives from cell hunger, movement, growth, association, programmed death, satisfaction, and other instinctia of all life. Restrained from a healthy former microbe, restrained but healthy former microbes find alliances to construct behaviors to practice. If what is called thought results from such cell interactions, multicellular interactions, then perhaps communicating organisms, each themselves thinking, can lead to a process greater than individual thought. Two modern neuroscience neuroscientists, Gerald Edelman of the Scripps Institute in California and William Colvin of the University of Washington Medical School have each proffered concepts of mind. From Edelman's work of fertile imagination comes the phrase neural Darwinism. Our brains both would agree become minds as they develop by rules of natural selection, Edelman 1985. This concept ultimately may provide a physiological basis for Butler's insights. In the developing brain of a mammalian fetus, some 10 to 12 neurons each become connected with one another in 10 to the fourth ways. These cell-to-cell -cell adhesions at the, surface mem at, at the surface membranes of nerve cells are called synaptic densities. As brains mature, over 90% of their cells die. By program death and predictable protein synthesis, connections selectively atrophy or hypertrophy. Neural selection against possibilities always dynamic leads to choice and learning as the remaining neurons' interactions strengthen. Cell adhesion molecules synthesize and some new synaptic densities form and strengthen as nerve cells selectively adhere and as a practice turns to habit. Selection is against most nerve cells and their connections, but is nonetheless for a precious few of them. Of course, new work may reveal a physical basis of thought and imagination, but little doubt exists that selective cell death in a vast field of proliferating biochemical possibilities may apply to developing minds in the same manner as does evolutionary change. Perhaps Descartes did not dare admit celebratory sensuality of life's Perhaps Descartes did not dare admit celebratory sensuality of life's exuberance. He negated that the will to live and grow emanating from all live beings, human and non-human, is declared by their simple presence. 
He ignored the existence of non-human sensuality. His legacy of denial has led to mechanistic, unstated assumptions. Nearly all our scientific colleagues still seek mechanisms to explain living matter, and they expect laws to emerge amenable to mathematical analysis. We demure. We should shed Descartes' legacy that surrounds us still and replace it with a deeper understanding of life's sentience. In Butler's terms, it is time to put the life back into biology. It will cost our culture until we recover our senses and return to the awareness that we must fully reject Cartesian anthropocentrism. We are interconnected not only to other people, but to all other living beings on this planet's surface. The received view is that air travel, telephone lines, internet computer hiccups, hookups, waterways, and fax machines connect only people. In fact, they connect through us and others all life. This incorrect view, symptomatic of residual Cartesian anthropocentrism, is biologically naive. Such rapidly communicating methods link not only us, but our planet mates as well. For inhabitants of the urban ecosystem, the connections are obvious. Whether or not we are conscious of others, cockroaches, sparrows, tomato plants, pigeons, and pubic lice, they clearly enjoy habitat expansion as we develop the Earth for more people. In retrospect, the Cartesian denial is exposed. We see Descartes' strategy as a Christian relic based on philosophical preconception rather than an attentive observation. At this late date in our Western heritage, we can shed our Cartesian mechanistic legacy at no risk of our scientific credibility. Consistency precludes Cartesianism. Either we are like other live organisms in that we both in that both we and they exert choices, or both we and they are mechanistic, deterministic beings whose choosing behavior is essentially, essentially illusory. The middle ground is philosophical quicksand. The great majority of the inhabitants on this third planet of our solar system are not humans, nor have they ever been human. Indeed, scientists and others who continue to ignore the members of 10 to 30 million species, the other sentient beings, do so at their own great loss. Our planet mates whose existence Descartes and so many of his modern day successors deny are communicants of the non-human splendor that if we let them can infuse our lives with joy and meaning. at the end there. Well, thanks for reading that with me. I look forward to talking to you about it. Let me know what you think in the comments. <laughs>